Okay. Uh, welcome to this lecture. Uh, we're going to proceed uh, talking about error control codes. Uh, in particular, we'll study linear error control codes, generator matrices, parity check matrices, etc., uh, as the main topic in this lecture. Okay. So I would like to begin with a summary of what we did uh, in the previous lecture. Uh, we saw through some simple examples then that error control codes can provide coding gains. Uh, the coding gain needs to be calculated in the BER versus EB over N0 plot and longer codes provide uh, good coding gains, uh, but we need to find good codes. I mean, not every code is going to be good. Uh, also, once we have a code, uh, we need to be able to decode it well. We need in particular soft decision decoders, uh, which are very important. Okay. So overall, I think finding a good code and efficiently implementing encoding, decoding, etc. is the main challenge and this has been overcome today and we will describe that in the rest of this course. Okay, So let us uh, proceed with uh, today's lecture. Okay. So today's lecture is on uh, linear codes. We will begin by describing uh, encoders for uh, linear codes. Uh, so if you see here, uh, this is a rate k by n code. Okay, There are k message bits coming in. This is the message m. There are k message bits. And this is the code word C. And you can see that I have assumed that the encoder is systematic in the sense that the message appears as a part of the code word. Okay, the message will appear in the part of the code word. I have chosen uh, n bits for the code word. First k bits is the message, and n minus k bits is the p part and this p vector is the set vector of parity bits. Okay. So this is uh, the most uh, common picture of an error control code. You have a message, you send that message along with that message to protect it from errors and provide coding gain, we add parity bits and send that as a code word. Okay. So the rate is k by n, uh, k is less than n. Okay. So this is the picture. Uh, so here is a simple example. So it is always good to have a simple representative example uh, and then understand the whole thing. And here is an example of how a, a linear block code would work. You have uh, rate half, uh, 3 bits uh, for the message and uh, 6 bits for the code word. Okay? And M0, M1 and M2 are the 3 message bits and the code word is composed of M0, M1, M2 first and then 3 parity bits. P0, P1, P2. And how are these parity bits computed? They are computed by linear operations, linear operations like addition, etc. But there is this modulo 2. So what is this modulo 2 addition? Okay, so this is uh, quite common. Uh, you have uh, two inputs, let us say uh, 0 and 1 inputs and then the output of modulo 2 addition, if you have 0, 0 as input, output is 0, 0, 1 as input, output is 1, 1, 0, it is 1, 1, 1 is 0. Okay? So it is modulo 2, so you divide by 2 and take the reminder. So if you have 1 and 1, 1 plus 1 is 2, but 2 is 0 modulo 2. Okay? So this is also called uh, binary XOR. Okay? So and this is a very important bread and butter operation for us. Uh, you should be comfortable with this XOR. Given two bits, you should be able to quickly XOR it. Uh, XOR is exclusive or uh, the bits are equal means the XOR becomes 0. The bits are not equal in 0, 1, or 1, 0, the XOR becomes 1. Okay? So that is the operation. Okay? So that is what we are going to do here. So how, how are we doing this? So you can see P0, P1, P2 are obtained as XORs or modular 2 addition of a subset of message bits. So this is a generally true statement for any uh, linear error control code. You have your message bits appearing uh, in the systematic encoder and then each parity bit is obtained as the XOR of a subset of message bits. Okay? So remember, uh, I have just taken two at a time here, but supposing even if you have three bits, you can make an XOR of all of them. You make the XOR of first two and then you make the XOR of the result with the third one. You can make an XOR of three bits as well or four bits or how many ever bits you have. Okay? So in this case, we are just taking two at a time. 
uh, for instance, P0 is the XOR of M0 and M1, P1 is the XOR of M1 and M2 and P2 is the XOR of M0 and M2. Okay. So, all uh, linear error control codes uh, when they have systematic encoding is, is described in this fashion. For instance, even in the 5G standard, uh, the LDPC codes are specified in this fashion. The encoder works like this. So, you have a message vector and then parity bits are computed as XORs of subsets of the message bits. You might have efficient ways of implementing these XORs, particularly when K and N are large, but essentially the description is exactly the same. Okay. So, this is a, an example of a linear code. Uh, I will use one more notation for this uh, linear code. Such codes, I will call them 6, 3 code. Okay. Okay. So, 6, 3 means n is equal to 6, k is equal to 3. Uh, but this is not the only 6, 3 code. There are several other 6, 3 codes, but this is a reasonable one. Uh, this specific 6, 3 code, which this kind of an encoder, we will use uh, repeatedly in this course as a, as a representative of a generic linear block code. We will talk about decoding, encoding and all that uh, with respect to this code. Okay? So, hopefully the picture is clear to you uh, and also you can imagine even if k becomes very large, even if n becomes very large, k could be like 1000, n could be like 2000 or something like that, this operation is not too difficult to perform. Okay? You just need to know a subset of the message bits, which subset to pick and then XOR them together. Okay, so, XORing is a reasonably simple operation to implement, one can do that. Okay? So, one can implement this encoder quite efficiently in practice, it would work uh, pretty well. Okay? So, this is the description of the uh, linear code from an encoding point of view. Okay? So, now it turns out uh, there is an important and useful matrix description for uh, linear block codes and that is uh, described here. Okay? So, the, the three operations we formed to find the three parity bits, P0, P1 and P2, P0 was what? P0 was M0 plus M1, P1 was M1 plus M2, and P2 was M1 plus, I am sorry, M0 plus M2, right. So, these three operations can be conveniently represented in this matrix form. So, you take M0, M1 and M2 and then multiply it on the right with this matrix 1, 1, 0, okay, right? m0, m1, m2 multiplied by 1, 1, 0 will give you m0 plus m1 and m0, m1, m2 multiplied by 0, 1, 1 will give you m1 plus m2 and m0, m1, m2 multiplied by 1, 0, 1 will give you m0 plus m2. Remember all operations are modulo 2, so I won't keep repeating this modulo 2 again and again and uh, so, so you have to assume that whenever I multiply matrices and all that, I always do a modulo 2, so 2 becomes 0. Okay, so, that is something important to know. Okay. So, so, the first thing one can do is make a generator matrix okay, which will produce the code word as the product of a, the message and this matrix. This matrix is called the generator matrix. and denoted G. Okay? So, you can see where this comes from. Uh, the first three bits of the code word are simply the, just the message bits themselves. So, you see you have the identity matrix here. So, this part is the identity part. right? Identity. I will denote this as I sub 3. To, to notice that this is a 3 by 3 identity matrix and then I have the parity part, okay, which is the same as what I wrote before. Uh, this is the parity part. Usually denoted P. Okay. So, this generator matrix G is I and then P. Okay. So, this will be a generic structure as we go through as well. So, you will have uh, an identity part and then a parity part. The parity part is obtained by various XORs. Okay? So, you can see clearly that this is the same as the previous operation and one can do it. Okay? So, another way to write this uh, uh, expression P0, P1, P2 is uh, message into this matrix uh, that you have here is to take uh, both parts to one side and equate it to 0. Okay? So, this is also uh, equally valid. Uh, if you do that, if you if you take it to this side, what will happen is 
you will get an identity here okay so you will get an identity here okay identity can come here and then you will get this parity check matrix okay so you can see this is very much equivalent to that i have taken both to one side and i have put the identity for the p part and i have got equal to 0 0 0 okay so this is the matrix here so you notice you have the identity here i3 and that part multiplies the p okay and then m0 m1 m2 uh, this is uh, the p okay so actually uh, if you look at it very closely this is actually p transpose okay so because i have shifted the left multiplication to right multiplication okay so the identity comes on the left the matrix comes on the left and everything becomes a column okay so i have sort of taken transpose on both sides to get uh, columns and uh, so this becomes p transpose and this is the identity matrix and then together you have this okay so so this once again is uh, C transpose, transpose of the code word. This entire matrix is called the parity check matrix H equals P transpose I. Okay. And once you have the parity check matrix, what you have is this relationship H times C transpose equals 0. So remember 0 is a vector 0 here. Okay, so there are as many zeros as you need here. Uh, so I'll put an underscore to I mean underline it to denote it's a vector. And this is uh, remember also, also everything is modulo two. Okay. Okay. So these two matrices play a very very important role in describing codes. Okay. So typically codes are described using generator matrices and parity check matrices. Okay. And they may be more generic then having just this IP sort of structure, maybe they are not systematic, maybe they have some other sort of form uh, and we will use both these things uh, when describing codes. So it turns out the polar codes are usually described with the generator matrix and the LDPC codes, the low density parity check codes of course are described using the parity check matrix. So both of these are very good descriptions of error control codes and you can see clearly that they are equivalent. Okay? They all come from the same idea that you have parities being formed as uh, XORs of subsets of the message bits and that gives you uh, this complete picture of having a parity check matrix or a, a generator matrix. Okay? So, so the code is fully described with uh, the parity check matrix. Hopefully you are convinced of that. Uh, see so remember M0, M1, M2 are the messages. So once I give you M0, M1 and M2, how do you find P0? You have to find P0 so that the first product, product with the first row equals 0. Okay? So if you take product with the first row, you get M0 plus M1 plus P0 equals 0. Okay? So that gives you P0 as M0 plus M1. Okay? So remember this is all uh, modulo 2, so minus 1 is the same as plus 1. So M0 plus M1 plus P1 equals 0 is the same as, uh, I'm sorry, M0 plus M1 plus P0 equals 0 is the same as P0 equals M0 plus M1. Okay? So maybe I should write that down for you. So if you look at the first row, the first row says M0 plus M1 plus P0 equals 0, which is the same as P0 equals M0 plus M1. Okay, so hopefully you see how the whole thing is working out. Every other parity bit is also conditioned in the same way. Okay, so you can use the parity check matrix to perform encoding as well. Okay, you take the first row that gives you the parity bit P0, the second row gives you the parity bit P1 the third row gives you the parity bit P2 and so on. Okay? So this description is very, very important uh, and in fact, all linear codes are described in this way. Uh, even the 7-4 Hamming code has a description like this. I, I, will, I will show you that uh, soon enough. Okay? So this is generator and parity check matrix. It is quite important. Okay, so let us generalize from what we had before. A code is technically defined as the set of all code words. You take all the code words together you have a, uh, you put them together in a set, okay, how many of a code words you have, that makes the code. And typically one thinks of an n comma k code, okay, so this is k message bits to n code word bits, uh, that means you have n minus k parity bits, uh, number of code words, equals 2 power k. Okay? 
So you have two power k code words typically uh, in a nk code and all of them uh, make up the code. So, you have a generator matrix for the linear code which is a k cross n generator matrix of uh, usually denoted g. It should have rank k in the it is a linear algebraic property over the over the vector space we are considering here. We do not need to talk too much about it in this class at least. Uh, so, in systematic form g can be written as i sub k, okay, the identity part and the parity part. Okay. So, the p is a k by n minus k matrix. Okay. So, when you multiply m with g, you get a code word. Okay. So, when you multiply m on the left side, m will multiply with the identity part to give you m itself, then m will multiply with the capital P matrix to give you the parity part P. Okay. So, this is exactly what we had before, one can generalize. But now, uh, there will be some codes where g will not have this form, it will not have a ikp form, it will not be in systematic form. But nevertheless, that is a valid description of a code. It turns out you can go from non-systematic forms to systematic form and all that. Uh, but it is not, uh, maybe it is not so important in this class. Uh, but nevertheless, you should know that G can have a more general form. In fact, when we talk about polar codes, I will describe them using the generator matrix. And when I specify the generator matrix for the polar code, you will see it is not in systematic form, not in the IKP form. Okay? But nevertheless, you can always form the code word as M times G. It would not have m may be appearing by itself in the code word, but it will produce some other n bit vector which you can transmit as the code. Word, okay? So, the parity check matrix for the same code is an n minus k cross n matrix uh, usually denoted h. It needs to have rank n minus k and there is one uh, important condition g times h transpose has to be equal to all 0 matrix. Okay? So, every row of g should uh, if you take a dot product or if you multiply with every row of h, you should get 0. Okay? So, that is the condition of the parity check matrix. It is said to describe the dual code and all that. Uh, in general, in this class, we will not talk too much about the linear algebraic properties of uh, codes and linear codes. It is not so important to us, uh, but nevertheless, it is good to do this uh, and read it, uh, read about it. I will be putting up some additional lectures from uh, prior courses. Uh, which precisely describe these linear algebraic properties. If you are interested, please go through them, uh, but it is sort of additional reading as far as this class is concerned. Okay? So, if you have the generator matrix in systematic form ikp, it turns out the parity check matrix is readily specified. You get h to be p transpose i n minus k. Okay? So, it is a little bit of an exercise to check that g specified as ikp and h specified as p transpose i n minus k. If you take a you know, transpose product of them, you get 0. It is uh, something you can check and the most important property is this. Okay. Once you have a parity check matrix, every code word satisfies H C transpose equals 0. Okay. So, just like the generator matrix is useful in encoding, uh, typically one uses the parity check matrix for decoding. You can also use it for encoding. It is sort of the same as the generator matrix, but typically one uses it for encoding. So, for instance, uh, if I give you an n bit vector, okay, some n bit vector and ask you whether or not it is a valid code word okay? or does it belong to this list of all code words that you have in the code, does it belong to the code. If I ask you that question, it is easiest to answer if you have the parity check matrix. Okay? So, what can you do? You can take the parity check matrix, multiply uh, that vector transpose on the right okay? and see if you get 0. If you get 0, then it, then it belongs to the code. If you do not get 0, it does not belong to the code. Okay? So, you can see that uh, given a vector, you can do this and uh, you can use it uh, in decoding also and it is quite efficient. Uh, on the other hand, gen with the generator matrix, maybe you cannot answer that question uh, immediately uh, and quickly. Okay? So, this is uh, a description and when we describe polar codes and LDPC codes, uh, I will describe them using generator and parity check matrices. Okay? Okay. So, so, like I mentioned, there is a vector space view. It is I will just mention it briefly. There are other lectures uh, that I will upload which will talk about this in more detail. Uh, this is the crux of the story. Uh, it turns out a n k linear code forms a k dimensional vector subspace of the n dimensional binary vector space. Uh, basically, that means modular 2 sum of 2 code words is another code word. Okay. So, that is quite easy to see in the way we described it. The rows of G are a basis for the code space, the basis for the uh, subspace which is the code space 
and the rows of h form the basis for the dual of the code space. Okay, so that is the whole story from a vector space point of view. Okay, so here are a couple of examples. I, I'll provide one more example, but this is the two simplest examples. One, uh, two, two examples we've seen before in this class. Okay, the first one is a three comma one repetition code. The code itself has just two code words, 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1. Okay. So, the generator matrix is just one row, 1, 1, 1. Okay. So, you can see it is a 1 cross 3 matrix. Okay. And uh, if you multiply by 0 on the left, you get 0, 0, 0. That is one code word. If you multiply by 1, you get 1, 1, 1. That is another code word. Okay. Now, the parity check matrix is a 2 cross 3 matrix. Remember, it is n minus k by n. And you can check that this is a valid parity check matrix. So, so you multiply with G trans G which has transpose, you will get 0 and that is a parity check matrix. Okay. The next uh, 6 comma 3 example code that we saw uh, has this list of code words. You can see uh, the message part comes here for instance, if you look at message part here, this is the M part. Okay. And then you have the P0, P0 being XOR of 1 and 0, P1 being XOR of uh, 1 and 2 and then P2 being the XOR of 1 and 3. Okay. So, that is a code word. Likewise, all the 8 different code words have been listed out here and the generator matrix is given here, the parity check matrix is given here. Okay. So, this is how uh, one can see uh, examples quickly. Okay. So, <coughs> okay. so, the last idea that we will uh, briefly introduce in this lecture is this of minimum distance. Okay. It is uh, it's not something that is very critical for us in this course, but it is an important design principle. It is very, very useful to know and have some intuition about the minimum distance and the role it plays uh, in uh, encoding, in decoding uh, successfully. Okay. So, this is uh, extremely important. A lot of uh, people who design codes have intuition about uh, minimum distance. Uh, it plays a role, uh, but as it turns out in modern codes, the role is a uh, little bit, uh, it is sort of used as a useful design criteria, but people do not uh, really try to optimize this as much as they used to do before. Uh, but nevertheless, it is important to know the definition. Okay? Uh, so, the first definition you need to know to understand minimum distance is the definition of Hamming distance. Okay? So, what is Hamming distance? If you take two different binary vectors of the same length, Hamming distance is the number of places where they are different. Okay, the, where they differ. Okay. So, here is a couple of examples. You can see 0, 0, 0 and 1, 1, 1 clearly differ in three places. Uh, this one maybe is a little bit more uh, difficult to write down, but again the difference is in three places. Okay. In all these three positions they differ. So, the Hamming minimum, uh, the Hamming distance between these two vectors is 3. Okay. Now, what is the minimum distance of a code? Uh, you have a lot of code words in the code. Okay. So, you have 2 par k code words. You take two at a time and find all possible distances. Okay, and uh, the least among those distances is the minimum distance of the code. Okay, so one can. I mean, this is not a very easy thing to calculate given a code, uh, but for some codes, one can easily do it. For instance, for the three comma one repetition code, the minimum distance is clearly three because there are only two code words zero 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 and one one one. But what about the six comma three example code? You look at this list of code words here what is the minimum distance? It is not immediate, right? So, you have to go through all possible pairs. Okay? There are a lot of pairs here. You can look at distances between any two of them and then find the minimum distance of that code. It turns out the answer is 3 for that code. Okay? So, it is not very uh, immediate. Okay? But nevertheless, this minimum distance is an important parameter. So, typically people specify that along with the n k, Okay, they will introduce that as a new parameter d. They will say it is an n k d code, uh, block length is n, dimension is k or message length is k and then the minimum distance equals d. Okay? Uh, but like I said in, in this course which is focused on LDPC polar codes, uh, the minimum distance would not make an explicit appearance. I will allude to it maybe when I can uh, later on. Okay? All right. So, it turns out for linear codes because the sum of two code words is also a code word one can simplify uh, some of the computation involved in the minimum distance. So, for instance, this is an important identity. Okay. So, if you want to find a number of places in which two vectors differ, you can take the XOR of the two vectors okay, and simply count the number of ones in the XOR. Okay. 
So, remember Hamming weight is defined as the number of ones in the vector, okay. That is Hamming weight. Remember Hamming distance is between two vectors, number of places in which they differ. If you have one vector, Hamming weight is the number of ones in it, okay. Now, given two vectors u v, there is a relationship between the Hamming distance between two u v and the weight of u plus v. So, if you take the xor of u and v, wherever they differ, the xor is going to be 1. Wherever they are the same, xor is going to be 0. So, if you take the xor and count the number of 1s, you get the Hamming distance and that is this relationship, okay. So, if I have a linear block code, the minimum distance is actually equal to the minimum weight of a non-zero code word, okay. It is easy to prove this, I have written down a small proof for it here, okay. The for a linear code, minimum distance is the minimum weight of a non-zero code word. So, in general, if you want to have a large minimum distance, you should make sure that there are no code words of low weight in a linear block code. So, if you go back and look at this example, if you want to find all possible pairwise distances in the 6, 3 example code, it is a lot of distances you have to compute. But if you just have to look at the code word of minimum weight, you have code words of weight 3, right. So, all this is weight 3. Right, this is uh, weight 4, right. So, this is uh, weight 3, this is weight 4, weight 4, weight 3. So, you can quickly tell that the minimum weight of a non-zero code word is 3 and since the code is linear, the minimum distance of this code is also 3, okay. So, that is a nice uh, little quick little calculation that one can do and that comes from this nice relationship between. Uh, uh, the special relationship between minimum distance and minimum weight of non-zero code words in linear codes, okay. So, this is a good thing to know. So, in general, you want, you do not want to have too many low weight code words in a code, okay. And that is a good design principle, okay. So, avoid to, uh, low weight code words. Okay, this is a good design principle for uh, linear code if you want to design it and come up with a good code, okay. So, here is a picture and I think this picture is uh, very good to have in your mind. Uh, when you think of codes, you should have a picture like this in your mind and this picture is, is very, very, uh, is, it gives you a certain intuition about how codes work, okay. So, you can pick, think of uh, the space of all 2 power n uh, uh, binary vectors. There are 2 power n binary vectors. So, you put them all in a circle, okay. So, you imagine there are all these small dots, all these vectors are, uh, these are the 2 power n binary vectors. So, out of these 2 power n binary vectors, there are 2 power k code words, okay. Those I am denoting as stars, these blue stars, okay. And what do we know based on the distance d? any two code words are at least a distance d apart, okay. So, that is what the minimum distance d means, okay. And you can imagine that the transmitter when you are transmitting, you are transmitting one of the stars, right. The code word is what is transmitted. But of course, noise gets added and what you receive is something else, something else away from the star, okay. And in general, uh, when you want to decode, you want, you are looking around from wherever you are, you are looking around to see the stars. And if there are too many stars, you are going to get confused, okay. So, whenever you have a received word and you want to look around and try to find uh, say the closest star or something nearby, you should not have too much confusion, okay. You should know clearly which direction to go, okay. And if all these stars are too close by, you are going to be confused. You, you will not know where to go, okay. So, that is a actually a pretty good intuition to have about how modern decoders work. So, modern decoders uh, will have the received word and start looking. Uh, for these code words, okay. And they look for them in multiple ways and remember you have to be efficient also. They use some very clever ideas, uh, we will discuss some of these ideas as we go along uh, to search for the closest possible um, code word in some sense, okay. And if you have too many close possible code words, you get confused. So, the code becomes bad. So, if you design a good code, you will not have for typical received vectors, you will not have too many code words contesting to be the closest code word and your decoder will succeed, okay. So, this kind of intuition about how the code works is uh, very cru crucial and when I describe the decoder, 
uh, for these modern codes, I will urge you to keep this picture in mind and the modern codes use some very nice clever ideas to search for these uh, code stars so to speak which are nearby uh, received vectors. Okay? So, we will stop here uh, for now in the next uh, lecture I am going to be doing some MATLAB coding uh, to show you how uh, soft decision maximum likelihood decoder works uh, for the Hamming code and maybe the example code that we had uh, here. Okay? So, we will do that uh, in the next lecture. Thank you.